A few important roster moves and a deeper dive into Ron Rivera's controversial decision on Sunday in Detroit. All of that and more coming up next on the Locked On Commanders podcast. You are Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Commanders fans, welcome aboard. Good to have you with us on the Locked On Commanders podcast. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team each and every day, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, free and available on all platforms, including YouTube and the WUSA 9 Plus app. Your CBS affiliate in Washington, D.C. has a new streaming app that's a game changer for local news and sports. Download it now. Uh, from your Roku or Amazon Fire TV stick. No matter how you're joining us, we appreciate you for making us your first listen or your first view of the day. My co-host, David Harrison, writing for Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation and Commander's Country, uh, is on the um, uh, is on a little break. Uh, it's his birthday coming up, so celebrating that. And, you know, we're doing some solo shows, uh, trying to give each other a, a, a little bit of a break. David, obviously, doing uh, double duty. Uh, I'm Chris Russell, one half of the Russell and Medhurst show on the Team 980, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to noon or anytime on demand or live on the free Odyssey app. And you can listen to this show on the Odyssey app, of course, as well. We're not here or there, somewhere in between. Uh, find us on Twitter at dharrison82, at Russellmania621, and the show at LO Commanders. LOC is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn and LinkedIn Jobs. They help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Why don't you post your job for free at LinkedIn? dot com slash locked on NFL. All right. So we begin the show with this bunch of uh, roster moves and some important moves uh, as well as you probably have heard. And you may remember late in the game on Sunday. And we mentioned this uh, in our post game Monday episode. Chase Roulier got hurt. Didn't look good. Well, it's not good. Chase Roulier has officially been put on the injured reserve list, which means he's got to miss at least the next four games. However, there are a bunch of unconfirmed reports, national and local, that he's likely lost for the season. And that is a brutal, brutal blow. John Keim of ESPN says they're waiting for the swelling to go down in Roulier's knee to determine the exact damage, uh, the timeline, and to get a second opinion. When that happens, guys, especially when there's swelling, it, it generally tends to mean some sort of ligament damage. Now, it could be something else. But clearly, they are very concerned, as they should be. Now, why is this huge? Well, Chase Roulier was injured, broken fibula, in the Denver game right before the bye last week, the eighth game of the season. So he missed the remaining nine games when the team came back from the bye and then worked his butt off over the offseason to get ready to play in week one, and he did. And... You know, Roulier is such a key part of that offensive line. The center, like the left tackle gets all the praise. The center is such a cerebral, to use a wrestling term, a cerebral assassin, right? They make all the checks, the calls. A lot of times they uh, change things on the fly based on you know, certainly the blocking scheme uh, and work hand-in-hand -hand with the quarterback. And obviously the snap, both under center, uh, pistol, shotgun, and it's all got to be right, and they've got to still get up and block. And Chase Roulier, a former sixth-round pick out of Wyoming, who was picked by this team, I think in 2018 if was the draft year, and developed by Bill Callahan, one of the better offensive line coaches in NFL history. Uh, Jay Gruden was, of course, the head coach. And then it has continued with Ron Rivera, John Matzkow, uh, who is also obviously one of the best offensive line coaches. And – Roulier has just been the glue. But when you can't play, it's really, really, really difficult to have that consistency, that unity, that, that chemistry. And we saw on Sunday that even with Roulier in there early, 
it still was pretty ugly, right? And they attacked the interior of that line. Now, I'm not saying they attacked Rulie specifically. They more seem like they went after Trey Turner. Uh, but the point being is, now without Rulie for at least, again, the next four games, and probably a whole lot more, and maybe the rest of the season, and with Wes Schweitzer banged up, Remember, he did not practice all last week. He did not play. Wes Schweitzer is expected to be the center this Sunday against Philadelphia, but we don't know where he's at in terms of his injury. I think he's got a hamstring. So to help replace Roulier on the roster, the team signed veteran center Nick Martin. Uh, as first reported by Ian Rappaport of NFL Network, uh, Martin started four years with Houston, the Texans, from 2017 through 2020, a former second-round pick, number 50 overall, I believe, was his draft slot. I uh, spent last season as a backup with the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, was cut this summer, hooked up with the New Orleans Saints, uh, and um, actually played in some of the preseason games. And again, it's expected that Wes Schweitzer will be the starting center, but if he's not ready, I don't know if, quite honestly, Nick Martin's going to be ready with all of the things the center has to process, especially against that interior with Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave, and uh, uh, just, oh, that is going to be really, really, really tough. Now, uh, Martin was, again, with New Orleans during training camp. He did play 120 snaps uh, according to PFF, and he drew a cumulative 66.0 grade out of 100, but an 87.0 in pass blocking. He played three games in Vegas last year, obviously not a lot as a backup, including one snap against Washington in early December. Now, in his last full year with Houston, again, he played 980 snaps, started all 16 games, drew a 56.1 overall, according to PFF, but again, a 74.0 out of 100 in pass blocking. And his pass blocking grade in 2019, his second to last full season in Houston, was much higher than his run blocking. So all the evidence I've got, without being an expert on Nick Martin, is that he's much better blocking and getting after it in the run in the pass game than he is in the run game, which is good in a way because this team wants to pass more than they want to run. So maybe that helps. I don't know. We will see if he's even ready and active on Sunday against Philadelphia. Also, the commanders claimed uh, defensive tackle John Ridgway, a fifth-round pick in this past year's draft out of Arkansas from the Dallas Cowboys. He played 94 defensive snaps for the Cowboys during the preseason, a cumulative of 49.3, according to PFF, and they cut Donovan Jeter, who was just signed a week ago. Uh, he played 18 snaps, had one tackle, and a 58 out of 100 grade on Sunday. And they kept Benning Potoai, who they signed from the Buccaneers practice squad. So that's the roster moves um, as of Tuesday early evening here. Uh, so I don't expect them to make another move, but you never know. Uh, Jerry Jones, the Dallas Cowboys owner, by the way, just a quick note, says on 105.3, the fan in Dallas, that Dak Prescott could possibly, could possibly return for the Commanders game next Sunday in Arlington. All right, coming up, a couple of observations after combing through most of uh, Sunday's game, uh, plus a deeper dive on Ron Rivera's decision and where Jahan Dotson didn't rank among the rookies uh, for week two, according to PFF. That's all still to come right here on the Locked On Commanders podcast. But first, guys, we tell you about our friends again at LinkedIn Jobs. That's right, LinkedIn Jobs. As you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. Just like a football team, you want to come out firing on all cylinders. Exactly what the commanders did not do last Sunday in Detroit. But LinkedIn Jobs is going to help that happen for you and help make it easier for you to find the people you want to talk to and for free. Um, I wish I had LinkedIn jobs when I was running a small business, the Sports Illustrated Commander site, then uh, by a different name, of course, started out the old, old team name, then it transitioned into the old now name, uh, the Washington football team. You get the whole idea. I didn't have that. And so I was kind of stuck doing my own research, my own filtering. Uh, if I had LinkedIn jobs, I would have been much better off. And now you can too. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then simply add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions 
questions. Uh, simply makes it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skill and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and hire. You don't have to waste time, right? It's why small businesses rank LinkedIn jobs number one in developing, uh, delivering, I should say, quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs is going to help you find the candidates you want to talk to and faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? I know I've done it in the past. Not right now, but I know I've done it in the past, and I still have a very much an active profile. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we welcome you back on the Locked On Commanders podcast. Good to have you with us. Thanks again for making us your first listen and your first view each and every day. So Jahan Dotson is nominated for the Pepsi Rookie of the Week Award uh, honor <clears throat> again for a second straight week. Of course, he won it last week. However, one of the interesting things, and you know, again, you can take it for what it's worth, he did not grade out as one of the 15 highest rookie graded players according to ProFootballFocus.com or PFF. Uh, I use PFF a lot. Quite, quite honestly, I don't always agree with what they do, but I, I like a lot of what they uh, use. He fell just short at 69.6, uh, which I believe would have qualified him for 16th overall. Uh, he fell just shy of the 15 mark, which was a 69 uh, point. Uh, he graded, I should say, a 69.3. 69.6 was the 15th ranked player. So, I mean, just a hair off. Maybe there was somebody in between. They didn't get specific to that. But again, a 69.3 for the Rook out of Penn State, even with the touchdown and a couple of big catches. But it was mostly his run blocking grade that PFF did not like. I think he was sub 30. So, that's certainly what hurt Jahan Dotson in terms of his overall grade. And fans have to remember that they're grading everything, not just one thing. Now, a further look into Ron Rivera's controversial decision uh, on Sunday in Detroit with the two-point conversion. Listen, uh, may, maybe some of you don't care at this point. It was a terrible loss. Uh, I know uh, David in his solo episode uh, that he did on Tuesday or for Tuesday, uh, talked about Jack Del Rio and the, uh, the, the 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 mob that's calling for him to be fired. I mean, Jamin Davis is putting out weird video memes uh, and gifts and and then taking it down because oh, you know, controversial. I, I don't even want to go in there because we don't know the intent. Uh, he's going to be asked about it in the media, assuming that he talks uh, this week, and then we'll uh, talk more about it then and his reaction. Uh, Jamin Davis, please. Listen, I, I like you. I want you to succeed. Please just worry about yourself. Please don't worry about the media. Don't worry about the fans. Don't worry about Jack Del Rio. Don't worry about Ron Rivera. Worry about you. Get better. And I thought he was better on Sunday. Not great, but I thought he was better on Sunday. Now, uh, some others had problems with run fits and all that stuff. I, I Listen, I'm not a coach. I, I know he wasn't perfect. I know he wasn't great, great, but he made some impactful plays beyond just the sack on the first drive. I'm just saying, Jamin Davis, get off of social media, scrub everything, don't pay attention to it, don't be a young man, think like a veteran and get off of it and focus on what you have to focus. And that's it. We'll have more reaction on that coming up. But now a further look into Ron Rivera's decision to go for two points uh, on Sunday in Detroit that has garnered so much uh, talk and discussion and whatever. So I had Jay Gruden, who, of course, we had here on the Locked On Commanders podcast, um, on uh, my radio show on Monday. So the radio station uh, has Jay on every Monday at 10 a.m. Uh, so if you want to listen to the former head coach and his analysis of not only the commanders, but also around the NFL, me and Pete Medhurst, uh, who I do the show with, uh, we talk to Jay every Monday at 10 a.m. So if you want to listen to that, listen uh, at the team980.com on the team980 uh, in the greater DMV area on your radio and or uh, anytime on demand on the Odyssey app. But he said, when I asked him directly, hey, you know, about the chart and what have you, and the particular decision that Ron used down 14 early in the fourth quarter or early-ish, still about 10 and a half minutes left to go in the game. They scored the touchdown, Antonio Gibson, they're down by eight after the touchdown, and Ron, of course, goes for two. 
And Jay said, quote, I've never believed in that. That is what the analytics do say. He did confirm that. He said, I know Doug Peterson does that all the time, but now Jacksonville coach, he said he did it all the time in Philadelphia. Certain coaches believe in that. I don't believe in that. This is Jay, quote, I don't believe in that. I believe in getting it back to seven and then making your decision on the next one to go for two for the win or not. And to that, and, and and this was also during the show, I went off and I said, you know, there's too much football outsiders in the media. There's too many analytics, too many scientists, too many mathematicians that are screwing with common sense. Think about it, right? If you live by a chart and a chart tells you you're down by 14 with 10 and a half minutes left to go, and then ultimately you're down by eight, that you have a better chance to win by going for two points, chasing points when you don't have to, instead of getting and accepting the traditional seven. Now, that's assuming that the place kicker makes the extra point. What it's basically telling you is, hey, you have a better chance of winning this game in regulation and not going to overtime. Guess what? That's great. I got to win the game. I got, or I've got to tie the game first. I can't worry about overtime until I get back to square one, to ground zero, basically, or squared. Okay. So the analytics can tell you you have a greater win probability, this, that, and the other thing, whatever. It doesn't matter if you don't execute. Now, you can still miss the two point conversion down eight and be down eight and get it the next time and then be tied. But that's what you were trying to avoid. If you would have simply gone with the extra point, you would be down seven, presuming that Joey Sly makes it. And that's not a safe presumption, which is part of the problem. Um, you would have been down seven. Then you would have needed one defensive stop. And then you would have needed a touchdown in order to tie. Now, again, I defended Ron to some degree on Sunday and on the Monday post-game show. I said, basically, the only thing I can think of is that either Ron doesn't have faith in Joey Sly, which is warranted, and two, uh, that he didn't want his defense to have to get or to rely on get them getting two stops without getting a point. Because if you make it seven, okay, if you kick the extra point, then they need a stop. You need a traditional touchdown and the extra point, and then they need another stop, and you need another score in order to win. That's two stops. If you convert on the two-point conversion down eight after the Gibson touchdown, you make it six, then they need one stop with, again, 10 minutes left to go. One stop, you need a touchdown, and then maybe you need a second stop. Not sure, kind of depending on how long the drives take and whatnot, okay? But, again, if you're trying to preserve and not ask too much out of your defense, which is already leaking major oil, maybe that was his thought. Now, Ron didn't get into that. Ron was like, oh, the chart, you guys should be happy about that. No, 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 actually, I'm not happy about that. Um, so here's where I wanted to go, just not to waste uh, any more of your time. But I did want to point this out. I uh, if, if you watch this podcast, you know I love Mike McDaniel. David was nice enough to uh, say hi to him when he was covering the Bucks dolphins camp uh, during training. And, he, you know, McDaniel remembered me and whatever. I mean, Mike and I, you know, we've gone to a wedding together. We've hung out socially. It's been a while since I've seen him. been a while since I've talked to him. But, you know, I try and leave these guys alone. Mike's been in San Francisco for a long time. I try and leave them alone if I don't have to bother them. They're very busy. They don't need me harassing them. But Mike McDaniel and the Dolphins had a tremendous comeback win Sunday in Baltimore, as you're probably well aware. Well, here's why I bring this up. McDaniel and the Fish were down 35-14 entering the fourth quarter, much further behind than Washington, right? They made it a 14-point deficit with 12-plus minutes left to go by scoring a touchdown and then kicking the extra point. That's how they made it a 14-point deficit, okay? That's, again, the same scenario, 14 points, that Washington was facing before Antonio Gibson's one-yard touchdown run to make it an eight-point deficit. Well, Miami then scored the first of two Tyreek Hill touchdowns, coming with seven-plus minutes left. Washington did it with 10-plus minutes, so Miami had less time, seven-plus minutes, instead of Washington's 10-plus minutes. And once again, on that first Tyreek Hill touchdown, down 14 and then down ultimately eight and facing the same decision again with less time. McDaniel chose to go for the extra point. They made it, Miami did, and made it a seven-point game. Again, Ron chose obviously the opposite, right, with more time left. Then, uh, again, while the commanders are still down by eight, everything unfolded the way it did. They missed the extra point on the next touchdown. They uh, just you know couldn't get off the field, couldn't make a defensive stop, exactly what I feared, uh, so on and so forth. But then McDaniel 
only needed a traditional seven, the touchdown and the extra point, on the next touchdown when Tyreek Hill scored another quickie with 519 left to go to tie it. And they would get it. Eventually, Baltimore would get a field goal. And then Miami would score another touchdown late in the final minute of the game and, of course, kick the extra point to win. So McDaniel faced a almost exact same situation and actually worse than Ron Rivera, and he didn't look at the chart, and he didn't give a you-know-what, and he won a game. Now, I'm not saying that Ron Rivera and the commanders would have won the game if they would have gone for the extra. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying – it was almost the exact same situation, and Mike McDaniel did what made sense, what makes common sense, and his team bailed him out and won and made him look like a genius. And Mike McDaniel is one of the smartest dudes you're ever going to know. He went to Yale. He's not a dum dum, okay? He's a really, really smart, shrewd guy, and he's a young guy, and you would think if anybody would embrace the analytics, it would be him. Instead, it was 59-year-old Ron Rivera saying, Guys, 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 I looked at the chart. Ha <laughs> ha, you should be happy. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, uh, I wasn't happy then. I tried to explain it and think that Ron was worried about Joey Sly and worried about his defense. Ron should have basically said, guys, look, I don't know. I didn't know if we could get the amount of stops that we needed, but he doesn't want to throw anybody under the bus. So he's just like, ha ha, I looked at the chart. I you. See, you guys should be proud of me. In actuality, no, Ron, I want you to use common sense. I don't want you to use the chart. I want you to use common sense. All right, coming up on the Locked On Commanders podcast, we will put a bow on this show and wrap it up with the Commanders slipping in the week three Locked On power rankings. That is next. But first, guys, we tell you about our friends at Bet Online and Bet Online, uh, of course, .net. They are your number one source for all of your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Already, the Eagles opened up as four point favorites on Sunday night after the Commanders lost, but with their win, and we're going to touch on that in a second over the Minnesota Vikings, it's expanded to around six and a half is where I last saw it. So the number is, of course, going up uh, as the public money and confidence in the Eagles. Uh, coming into FedEx field rises early in the week here. Find out all of the latest football uh, developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, and more, including uh, all the action on the week three NFL slate and the college football slate. That's how you can get involved in live sports wagering uh, and live betting, esports, and more. The fastest and easiest way to check in on everything you care about, including Major League Baseball is betonline.net. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action at Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, wrapping up this edition of the Locked On Commanders podcast. We appreciate you guys uh, being with us. All right, uh, so here's the deal. Every week we have the Locked On NFL Power Rankings, and I'm going to bring these to you on the Wednesday edition, late Tuesday night, depending on when you are watching this and how you're watching it, uh, whether it's YouTube uh, the WUSA 9 app, or listening, of course, on any major platform, including Odyssey and Spotify and iTunes. All right, so the Arizona Cardinals, by virtue of their tremendous comeback win, go from number 21 after a big slide last week all the way back up to number 12. How about the Detroit Lions? Uh, they went from number 26 by virtue of their win over the Commanders and how impressed people were all the way up to number 17. How about the New England Patriots? After a dreadful week one performance, they go from 24 to one spot ahead of the Lions at 16. The Indianapolis Colts, 0-1-1 uh, to start the year and have looked awful and shut out in Jacksonville, go from number 16 all the way down to number 27. Want to speak about awful? How about the Tennessee Titans? 
0-2 after getting drubbed by the Buffalo Bills on Monday night in Buffalo, go from number 19 down to number 26. The Titans are at FedEx Field in Week 5. The Minnesota Vikings, who are also at FedEx Field later on this season, after getting annihilated on Monday night football, drop from number 9 to number 15. So that brings us to where the Commanders wound up, and that was at number 22. From number 20, so a two-spot drop, but they're still one spot ahead of the Dallas Cowboys, who do bump up from number 27 to number 23 with their last second win over Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. The Giants at 2-0 and go from 23 to number 20. Remember, they started really low. I think they were 31 in the initial week one rankings before upsetting the Titans and then beating the Carolina Panthers at home. And the Eagles, by virtue of their big win on Monday night, go from number seven to number four, and they come to FedEx Field this Sunday. Speaking of the Eagles, we'll have a crossover Thursday edition on the next episode of the Locked On Commanders podcast with the guys from Locked On Eagles, Louis DiBiase and Gino Camilleri. Not sure if both guys will be able to join us uh, or not, but one will be here at the very minimum. But some quick thoughts on the Eagles. Again, they throttled uh, Kirk Cousins, Kevin O'Connell and the Minnesota Vikings 24 to 7 on Monday night at Lincoln Financial Field to improve to 2-0. and They did all of their damage in the first half, and then everybody just basically shut it down. Nobody scored a single point on either side in the second half, right? Uh, maybe not as good for the Eagles' offense, but certainly a good sign for the Eagles' defense, and they turned Kirk Cousins over, uh, what, uh, twice in the second half, one on an end zone interception by Darius Slay, who was un believable in that game playing man zone. We'll talk more with the guys about that and how they're deploying Darius Slay. Jonathan Gagnon is blitzing the crap out of the Minnesota Vikings offensive line. Uh, Jalen Hurts, of course, was extremely accurate. He was uh, a star in the first half, a couple of rushing touchdowns. You know that's always a big thing. Who's going to spy him and mirror him? Can they afford one guy? Well, if it is one guy, I my guess would be Jamin Davis. I don't know that. They'll never tell you that, but he's an athlete who can run. And maybe if you give him less to, per se, think about in coverage and run fits, then maybe, just maybe, that might be a good usage of Jamin Davis. Or it could be one of the safeties, as Cam Curl was officially cleared to return. That first reported by John Kime on Tuesday morning. So it looks like Cam Curl will make his 2022 debut, and that could mean more of the Buffalo nickel, right? Three safeties instead of three corners and two safeties. Safeties. The Eagles have a top shelf offensive line that's not going to change uh, and a great running game with Hertz, Kenneth Gainwell, uh, uh, Sanders, uh, Miles Sanders and, and Boston Scott. Right. And they can throw it out of the backfield uh, screens and, and wheel routes and all that. So look for that to be a big part uh, of their game plan. And again, we mentioned big play. Darius Slay. Uh, and as well, remember, they signed James Bradbury, a former Ron Rivera Carolina Panther, a draft pick that a lot of fans wanted here in Washington. All right, that's going to do it for us on this particular edition of the Locked On Commanders podcast. We want to thank you again for making LOC your first listen and your first watch of the day. Come back for the next episode. We'll have that Locked On crossover Thursday edition as we get you set for the Eagles and the Washington Commanders. Now make your second listen and view the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock, former NFL scout Matt Williamson, give you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes that you need. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. If you want to hop in, it's 301-615-3577. That's 301-615-3577. I know we have a couple of voicemails uh, built up. We will get to them later on this week or locked on Washington Commanders at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us today. Commanders fans, thanks again for joining us. We are free and available on all platforms, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team each and every day for David Harrison, who's out on this edition and also on the next edition because it's his birthday. Wish him a happy birthday. Um, he's normally covering the Washington Commanders on SI.com's Fan Nation and Commanders Country. I'm Chris Russell, one half of the Russell and Matt Hurst Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app. We'll be back right here. On the Locked On Commanders podcast.